Aside from the obvious of taking out small game animals and birds, a shotgun cartridge can actually have multiple survival uses. There are a number of different components to a shotgun cartridge, and if you are careful, you can gently take apart this cartridge and expose these components with a knife. I do this by gently rolling my knife around the end of the cartridge. The first part that comes out is the shot. It's important that you keep this shot safe and don't let it spill out onto the forest floor. If you want, you can melt this lead shot down over a campfire and pour it into a makeshift mould for your very own DIY fishing weight. You'll want protective breathing gear on though, as you don't want to breathe in the toxic fumes. The next component of the cartridge is the wadding. On some shotgun cartridges, this wadding is made from plastic. But in the majority of cartridges in the UK these days, it's made up of a fibre wad, which is more environmentally friendly. If you remove more of the plastic outer casing, you will eventually get to the propellant. If you scrape out the fibre wadding with your knife and hold a lighter to it for a few seconds, it will actually burn for a long time, and it can be a great way to get fire going in wet weather. Finally, at the base of the cartridge, you will have the propellant. Traditionally, black powder used to be the only propellant available. This is because in those days, guns had longer barrels because the extra length gave the powder time to burn completely and develop pressure to fire the pellets. Nowadays, a more modern nitro smokeless propellant is used, which burns more efficiently. So how does any of this relate to survival? Well, like I said, the fibre wadding can be pulled apart and if you hold the lighter to it for a few seconds, it will readily take a flame and burn for a long time. Great for fire lighting in wet weather. As for the nitro powder, this can take a spark from a fire still and will burn hot and fast. It's important to note that it is a flash tinder and burns incredibly fast, so dry tinder is needed on hand ready to transfer that flame to a more established fire. You'll notice throughout this entire process that the fiber wadding at the base of the screen is still smoldering away, almost acting like a burning coal when you've successfully made a bow drill. This particular wadding smoldered like this for 10 minutes. Cutting apart a shotgun cartridge like this is not the safest thing to do, and so I wouldn't recommend you do this at home. The propellant is dangerous, and although you can get fire going with it, I would use faster, more safer alternatives. On the inside lid of my fire kit, I keep a small needle, for repairing kit, or to help remove splinters from my hands. However, a simple needle can also be used as a makeshift compass. The needle I'm using here is actually a leather stitching needle, bigger than the one I normally have in my kit. This is just so that you guys have a clearer picture of the demonstration, and it's visibly much easier to see than the smaller sewing needle I use. Normally, you would need to magnetize the needle first. This is most commonly done with a magnet or a battery, but there is another rudimentary way. I just gently scrape the blade of my knife against the needle, running it just one way up for about five minutes. Then find a small leaf and look for a puddle or small piece of still water. Place the leaf on the water, making sure it floats. Put the needle on top of the leaf and watch as it spins around, letting the forces of the magnetic field do its work. After a few seconds, one end of the needle should point towards north. This method works best on a still day with no wind. Be aware it's not hugely accurate and it will only give a rough idea of north. A good working compass will always be safer to rely on. It might also be worth magnetizing your needle at home first and then marking which end of the needle will point north. That way, when you go to do it in the field, you know which end of the needle is going to point in the right direction. A small, yet really useful piece of kit to have in your pack is a loop. This is a small magnification device, which I use to help identify different wild plants and fungi. Occasionally, toxic plants, trees and fungi share very similar characteristics with edible ones. So being able to use a loop allows me to differentiate the key features and characteristics on a microscopic level. It also has multiple other survival uses, such as getting a fire going using the power of the sunlight, or using it to help remove small splinters from my hands. I've even used it to help remove small ticks during the summer months. This particular loop was only about five pounds and has a 10 times magnification on it, which is more than enough for what I need it for. I'll link to it down below for those who are interested. 
During the winter months, when temperatures drop below freezing, I'll bust out my winter gloves. These are made from leather, so that they can handle hot embers and pots or pans on the fire. Inside, they have a wool inner glove, which gives them excellent thermal value during the sub-zero days. However, they're not cheap gloves, but given I use them on most days throughout winter, I can more than justify the cost of them. It's often our fingertips that will get cold first during the freezing conditions. This is because our body prioritises pumping blood to our vital organs, and so our extremities, such as fingers and toes, are the first to get cold. To help prevent your fingertips getting cold, you can fold a small cotton wool pad over your fingertip and push it into the tip of your glove. It will stay there and keep your fingertips warm. You only need a thin piece of cotton wool for it to be effective. If you need to get a fire going, you can pull out one of the pieces of cotton wool and use a fire steel to ignite it. They burn for a surprisingly long time, even longer if you coat them in Vaseline. But then you wouldn't want to put them in the tips of your gloves if they were covered in Vaseline. As part of my fire kit, I always carry a small tin which contains some flint, a steel striker, and some char cloth or twine. Not only is this another backup fire lighting option if my lighter fails me, but it's also a very traditional way of lighting a fire, and a skill that I think should continue to be passed on to others, so that the knowledge stays alive. These storage tins can come in different shapes and sizes, and the contents kept within is really up to you. But just a simple flint and steel striker with a small amount of char cloth will still get dozens of fires lit before you need to resupply the tin. The char cloth will be the first item to run out. The striker and flint will have many hundreds of strikes in them before they begin to fail. You can also get more traditional looking tins, such as this Copper Hudson Bay inspired version. The contents are still pretty much the same, except that there is a small magnifying glass in the lid itself, so that you can start a fire by sunlight on the clear sunny days. You can easily put together your own kit using an Altoids mint tin. These have small hinges on them and a perfect size to fit in your pocket. Although you might not use a flint and steel often, it's well worth having one of these in your pack. Whilst on the topic of flint and steel, let me give you some tips on getting a fire going using this traditional method. First off, you'll need to make sure you're able to get sparks to come off the flint and steel. The sharper the edge of the flint, the more likely you are going to get sparks. I tend to angle the edge of the flint slightly upwards. The sparks themselves aren't coming from the flint, but they're actually small pieces of metal coming off the steel striker. You'll notice the majority of the sparks tend to fly upwards. So with your piece of char cloth, you need to place this on top of the flint, ready to catch sparks. I leave a few millimetres of gap between the char cloth and the edge of the flint. This allows the sparks to ignite before they hit the char cloth. After just a few strikes, one of the sparks catches onto the char cloth. It's important to blow on this ember straight away, so that it establishes and doesn't burn out. Once there is an ember of around the size of a pea, you can relax and get your tinder ready. Given that it's winter time, the most readily available tinder to me in this woodland is dead bracken. It's off the ground and it's dry. I pick enough to make a small bird's nest. If the weather was wet and the bracken was wet, I would need to dry out the bracken first by buffing it up in my hands. I would also collect a lot more of it. Now I place the small piece of glowing char cloth in the middle of the bird's nest. I give it a quick blast of air just to spread the ember across the cloth so that I don't have to force too much more air into it when I close up the bundle. Now I check for where the wind is blowing. And I tend to put my back to the wind, as the wind will help to do a lot of the work for me by blowing oxygen into the ember. Then I begin to breathe more air into the tinder bundle, directing it at the char cloth. In between breaths, I just waft the tinder bundle up and down, which forces oxygen into the ember without me having to waste time getting dizzy blowing into it rigorously. After just a few seconds, the fire starts. Once you have the technique mastered, it's actually a fairly easy method of fire lighting, and one to add to your skill set. It's important that whatever tinder you are using, to make sure you have your kindling readily available nearby, as often the hardest part of this type of fire lighting is not getting the flame itself, but keeping the fire going long enough for the kindling to ignite. Another material that I keep in my fire lighting tin is jute twine. This works well as a tinder when it's fluffed up. If you only have a small piece of char cloth, or if it's burning out fast, and you know you don't have enough to get a fire going, 
you can pass this ember onto the end of some jute twine where it will continue to burn for a long time. A while ago, a subscriber sent me this piece of rope with a sliding metal cap to it. It works in a similar fashion to the jute twine. I just flap up the end of the rope and shower it with sparks from the fire steel. Once it catches an ember, I can transfer it to a tinder bundle to get a fire going. I can then put the ember out and slide over the metal cap to keep the rope from fraying and unravelling in my pack. It can be used in other ways too, and although I don't tend to use it often, I still keep it in the side pocket of my pack. Going back to the leather gloves that I use during the colder months, here in the UK, we get a lot of rain year round. To help increase the life of my gloves, I will always treat them with some wax to weatherproof them. This is usually a paraffin and beeswax mix. At home, it's much easier to apply when the wax is at room temperature, but out in the field, it's a little more tricky. As you've seen from my previous survival tips videos, I always have a small candle or tea light in my kit. More for if the fuel in my lighter is low, I can light the candle and I can still get a fire going without having to worry about the flame going out anytime soon. I use this tea light to soften the wax before applying it to the glove. Once the wax starts to drip, then I know it's soft enough to apply. I rub it into the glove. Normally, I would then hold my gloves or leather item over a campfire so that the wax remelts and impregnates into the fibers of the glove, helping to waterproof it. But if I don't have a fire going, then I just use the candle. It takes a lot longer, but it still gets the job done. As well as becoming more weatherproof, the wax also helps to make the gloves more supple and gives greater dexterity, which is needed during the colder months. And there's just a few tips to help you in the great outdoors. If you like this sort of video, feel free to subscribe. And if you want to watch more like this, with tips on trapping, primitive bushcraft, and much more, then head to my survival skills playlist, which is in the video description below. Thanks for watching folks, and I'll catch you in the next one.